Quest for Fire is a 1981 release prehistoric fantasy adventure film directed by Jean-Jacques Anou. It's set in the Paleolithic era of Europe, um, which is around 80,000 years ago. And it's the tale of a, sort of a tribe of cavemen who are in possession of fire, um, but they don't know how to create it. They can only gather it naturally, so to speak, and they have a little thing, I guess like a lantern almost, that they sort of keep it in and feed the fire, and then they can they can start bigger fires from that little lantern. At the start of the film, they're attacked by another tribe of, they're more like eight men, and yeah, some of their number are killed, and the yeah, these eight men try and, you know, they want to steal the fire for themselves, but some of the tribe get away and hide out in a swamp. Well, hiding in a swamp is wet, <laughs> Fire's not going to go well with that, and it, it goes out, unfortunately. The tribe are dismayed by this, so three of them, played by Everett McGill, Ron Perlman, and Namir El Caddy, set off on a quest for fire, hence the title. I don't know how they think they're going to find it, but I guess yeah, they just want to find a fire so they can take it, and they, they take the lantern with them so they can... They can relight it and, yeah, and hopefully return to their tribe at some point when, when they've done that. Yeah, it's the adventures they have on the way, basically. You know, they, they encounter sabre-tooth... I don't know, they're tigers? They don't look very much like tigers. They look like lions with, with prosthetic false teeth. False teeth, false yeah. teeth yes. <laughs> but, yeah, they, they get chased up a tree by them and they encounter a cannibalistic tribe who do have some fire, so um, they try and uh, take it from them. They, they encounter... Yeah, the cannibalistic tribe have got some some sort of uh, prisoners that they're eating, and they manage to free one of them, a female who who's played by Ray Dawn Chong. She tags along with them on their continued quest, and obviously they want to return with their their fire back to their tribe. But they're getting more misadventures along the way. They do many misadventures <laughs> along the way. I kept thinking, I kept it kept reminding me of the Olympic torch as they yes. were carrying it back. So I want to keep this thing alight. So this is following on in our month of prehistory films. Mm -hmm. uh, what's actually kind of interesting is that we seem to be going. It's kind of it wasn't planned out like this, but we're going back through history. Mm. So we started five thousand years ago with Iceman. The Clan of the Cave Bear was twenty thousand years. About twenty thousand yeah. years, and this one is eighty thousand years back. So we're kind of slowly going backwards, mm. further into the past. And of course, with that, the the types of prehistoric humans. They devolve, I suppose. Mm, yeah. I think this is quite an interesting production. I mean, it's a French-Canadian production. It's directed by a Frenchman. I hadn't really... I had heard the name, but he made in The Name of the Rose, mm. the Sean Connery film, uh, which I think has recently been turned into a TV show as well, hasn't it? A story. Yeah, that rings about, actually, yeah. This is quite similar, I think, to... Well, I don't know. It's quite similar to last week's, and this is quite a bit kind of a full-scale production, mm. like Clan of the Cave Bear. I did enjoy this one, and I think, actually... Well, Iceman was really good. I think mm. I, this is kind of, at the moment, my favourite. So you've obviously got Ron Perlman in there and Everett McGill. I mean, you know, Ron Perlman, hugely famous for many films over the years. I know you like a lot of his work, don't you? Like yeah. um, Hellboy. Hellboy. And <laughs> I mean, we did, the, you know, he was in The Last Supper, one of our very he first was, pips, of course. wasn't he? Yeah, he was in um, that, yeah. No, he's not. Obviously, everyone's in, well, most people are in prosthetics to, cert to a certain extent in this. And, of course, he was in the Beauty and the Beast series, um, with Linda Hamilton and obviously in heavy prosthetics for that as well. So and Hellboy, you know. So he's not. Um, no, uh, not, no, he's used to, to being under heavy makeup. No, exactly. Say. And then you got Everett McGill, who turns up in Twin Peaks. Uh, he was in The People Under the Stairs, another film we covered a while yep. ago. Uh, so he's well, very well known. Probably mostly known for Twin Peaks, I would say. And Under Siege Two. And Under Siege <laughs> Two. That's yeah. Get that one in there as well. Of course, he was in that. The other, the other three of them. It's not someone I knew personally. The other, the other. No, no. I, I, I mean, he's no. I mean, he's been in other things that I've yeah seen, and I mean, he's in Navy Seals, I think, isn't he? But um, <laughs> no, but no, he's not. The name wasn't familiar, and and again, because because he's sort of under heavy makeup and and hair and beard, a bit difficult to to sort of imagine him without that. So yeah, um, obviously but I you know think... what I know what Ron Perlman looks like, but um... yeah, but I think so. I mean, this was actually Ron Perlman's first film, mm. and, and possibly one of Everett McGill's first films as well. He was, I think, he did a lot of stage work before this. But what's great is they all work so well together, and it's quite an odd film. This because there are, there are times that I think it's very, it's quite amusing 
Mm. Whether that's intentional or not, I think there are certainly moments in there that are intentional, that are supposed to be funny yeah. and humorous. But then there are other moments, simply because I think of the of the uh, the mannerisms that they do and the costumes and things that they do just because of what they look like. But I was totally, it, it, I was totally with them the whole time. Mm. It was mm. compelling, and I really enjoyed the journey that they took us on. Uh, Ron Perlman, I think, was just born for this role. I mean, he's totally... I mean, some of his mannerisms, yeah, like yeah. the ape mannerisms that mm. he does, is just amazing, and yeah. he really gets that. Everett McGill plays it in a completely different way, but he does a lot of voice stuff, so there's lots of kind of, like, you know, grunting and shouting, which actually, weirdly, he actually does in The People Under the Stairs, because he's that kind of weird character <laughs> and that, who kind of, you know, runs around the place with his, you know, s and gear on, kind of moaning a lot. Uh, which kind of reminded me of, of, of that in this film as well. Uh, and the other chap as well. I thought, you know, he was kind of the more comical one, I think, out of the, out, out of the three of them. But they just, I just really enjoyed following them mm. along their journey. And then Ray Dawn Chong, who I knew from Commando, she's, obviously she's done many other films over her career as well, but I personally know her. I remember her from Commando. She's yeah. great in that. Uh, and she's she's great in this too, and she kind of joins the the role. She she, she joins the three of them. I don't know if it's wholly, completely realistic. This film they do call it a fantasy yeah. drama, so I think there are kind of made up elements going. on I mean, on I think it. anthropologists said that that you know because there's so many different types of sort of humanoids around, they wouldn't have all been around at the same oh, time, and, cer- at the same and certainly time, not though. in close proximity like they are. Ray Dawn Chong's tribe almost reminded me of like the tribe in Cannibal Holocaust. Yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, they're more advanced. You know, they yeah. they can make fire and they wear. You know, they they sort of adorn themselves with sort of masks and and jewelry and things like that. Whereas obviously the cavemen, they simply just wear animal skins just for warmth. You know, they don't do anything else. Kudos to her. She spends most of the film naked, <laughs> so running yeah. around. Uh, yeah. You know, she's obviously she's got sort of body paint on head to toe, and she you know they're sort of her, again her tribe. Has a has a more developed language as well, and she you know she sells that you know she's constantly chattering at them, and obviously they haven't got a clue what she's talking about. <laughs> I mean, talking about the, about the the language, a lot of it was created by um, Anthony Burgess, who wrote um, A Clockwork Orange, because obviously we don't know exactly how these cavemen and other tribes spoke. The tribe of um, Ray Dong Chong's character, I think their language is based on. Native Canadian yeah, Inuit in, Cree yeah. tribes, and apparently, when because uh, I think a lot of that is still spoken today, mm. and when they saw it in the cinema, they they kind of made them laugh hysterically it's because just, it was just they, nonsense. <laughs> well, it was they were using actual words, but they made absolutely no sense yeah, to yeah. the plot <laughs> in the, when when they were speaking it, which mm. is quite amusing. There's no subtitles, so I don't know if we mentioned that, but um, so obviously, in in Clan of the Cave Bear. There is some subtitles for their sort of grunts and sign language and things like that. But in this, no, again, it's it's like Iceman where there's no... You don't need it. it the story is told visually and, and you know, by body language and, uh, and their facial expressions and things like that. So It was interesting when Anthony Burgess's name came up on the screen because when I, when at the very beginning of the film, I kind of felt like I was watching a Kubrick film because the music felt very much like something out of a Kubrick film. Mm. I mean, obviously, the beginning of 2001 is set during mm. this period, so there was that feeling as well. But there was some kind of feeling I got from it which felt a little bit Kubrick. So when Anthony Burgess's name sprung up, I mean, I know that's only, yeah, that's obviously just a link by the novel he wrote, but I don't know, it just kind of put me in that place and that time frame and that whole visual thing. Mm. Um, I'm not saying this is anything like a Kubrick film <laughs> at all. It's, it's not, although I did read that a lot of people kind of did suggest it, it felt like a long version of that beginning section mm. of 2001. So I think that possibly the director certainly obviously knows of that film and, and, and perhaps thought of that film while he was while he was making this and maybe that's why it, what led him to using Anthony Burgess for the for the te- for the language. I, I don't know. I mean obviously he created the language that the Droogs he did. speak yeah, in, in the Clockwork Orange. Um, adept at making up languages. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> so, a very, very clever man. Yes. Yeah, I mean, obviously, like we said, I think it's not particularly accurate as far as the sort of different races of humanoids that are interacting. But it, it still feels, you know, if you, if you put that aside, it still feels authentic and everyone looks grimy and dirty. And I think Clan of the Cave Bear, 
maybe a little bit too clean sometimes. I don't. Yeah, and also because this one of... brings in violence, there's some violent stuff in there. Yeah, this one yeah. feels more authentic in that regard, which mm. the clown of the cave bear didn't really do. I mean, Iceman brought that in, but kind of with a modern day revenge mm. story thrown in, and, and in fact, lots of it felt slightly. I mean, obviously, it's not quite as old as this, so they have developed more. So that's maybe that, that that's probably safe to say that was probably what it was like. But this really felt quite it felt vicious, mm. and it, yeah, it did feel very authentic. Actually, it was a really great scene at the beginning of the film where I think Ron Perlman is by himself. He's kind of he's like keeping watch, and it's at night. But then the camera kind of pans into the cave where his tribe are, and they're all asleep. But they're asleep like a pack of lions or mm. pack of wolves. You know, they're all kind of huddled up together, keeping warm in this cave. And uh, things like that. Uh, there were moments in this film that, that felt very authentic. But they did use uh, Desmond Morris, who was a famous anthropologist. Mm. My mum had this amazing book when I was growing up called Man Watching, which was by Desmond Morris. I think, I think a lot of it maybe has been, it feels a bit old now, because mm. obviously you know, research and science has, has come on since then. And they used him, they brought him as, in as a kind of advisor. For, for a lot of it. And then also Peter Elliott, who is the British born kind of monkey man, you know, he does, he did all the monkey work in Gorillas in the Mist. I think, as you mentioned, he's kind of like the, 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 the original Andy Circus, you mm. know, he does, he, he, he understands the way apes yeah. are. And so using people like Desmond Morris and Peter Elliott and putting those two, to, uh, bringing those people together, you end up with quite an authentic look at, at, at that time, I think. Mm. And I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was. It was warm, it was funny. There were some very funny moments, like I said, maybe intentional or not intentional, but it didn't bother me in the slightest if it was unintentional mm. because I thought the three of them and, and Ray Dawn Chong as well worked really well together. Yeah. Like I wanted to see where they went. You know, I, I, was, I was completely with them the yeah, whole time. Yeah, definitely, I, definitely. It was, and it looks great, you know. Mm. So it was filmed in Scotland and Canada and Kenya as well, mm. they filmed it in. So a real range of different places. Yeah, obviously, in those back back then, you know, the world would have been very different to how it looks now. Mm. Apparently, there were no saber-tooth... I think it's set in it. It's supposed to be set in Europe, isn't it? There were no yeah. saber-tooth tigers, tigers, whatever, saber-tooth big cats in, right. in okay. there. They were, I think they were in sort of North America. Oh, OK, um, fair enough. Well, like mammoths, because there were some quite... quite, I think, quite yeah, I think they were around, yeah. Interesting-looking mammoths in this. Where mm. I think they'd use them elephants and cover yeah. them up. And uh, I mean, that you know, that looked pretty good. It looked really um, good, yeah. It was more bear action as well, although not Bart the Bear It wasn't time. Bart the Bear this time, <laughs> but again, another hats off to the guy having a bit of yeah. a play fight with the bear, because that was, yeah, pretty pretty intense stuff again. I mean, at the start of the film, there's, there's scenes with wolves. Uh, oh, that and was... And again, you know, there's some... You know, stump men, obviously, with, with padding on their arms and the wolves are going for them. And yeah, you don't so. quite... I know, because wolves are obviously... I mean, the only time you come, tend to come across wolves in cinema or in genre cinema is maybe the werewolf and mm. things like that, but obviously that's always, you know, men in makeup and stuff. But there are, there are real shots of wolves here with their teeth out. Mm. You don't realise just how vicious <laughs> those, those guys are. Yeah, not ones you want to... Uh, Taken a walk down the park. No. You? So yeah, no. I thought yeah, I really enjoyed this film, mm. and uh, but we don't have this on DVD, do we? We watched it somewhere. No, it's on it's on YouTube at the moment. So um, right, you know, it's on YouTube for, to watch for free. Um, there is various um, Blu-rays and DVDs. I mean, Second Sight released it in the UK a few years ago. Um, it's cut by eight seconds because at the start, um, when Ron Perlman is, is sort of guarding the the camp or the cave rather. He chucks a flaming stick at, at some wolves that are sniffing around, and, and one of them actually catches fire. Oh, right. Um, so they had to, you know, they because the BBFC won't allow any sort of animal cruelty, yep. and fair enough, that short section was cut out. I mean, you, if you want to see that footage, that is also on YouTube. The version, the full version of the film is the cut version. Um, but yeah, that footage is on, is on YouTube. I mean, presumably it was accidental because there is literally just some wolves out there and a Obviously, somebody off camera throws a throws a flaming stick at them, and it just happens to sort of give one of them a glancing blow, and of course sets their sets the fur on fire. You'd like to hope that as the wolves run off camera, there's some sort of wolf wrangler who quickly put it out. Don't know. <laughs> I'd like to hope so though. Um, yeah, that was that's that's missing from the UK version, but it's out in Germany and France. Um, but I don't think obviously the film itself doesn't really matter because there's no there's no subtitles. Only the part of the beginning. You know, will be in French or German or whatever language um, you buy it in. But um, I think all the extras aren't particularly English friendly either. 
But it doesn't appear to be a US release, not on Blu-ray anyway, which I'm I'm surprised about. Or even a Canadian one, you'd think it would have been released in Canada. Yeah, I might pick up the, the second site DV, uh, Blu-ray at some point if I first see it cheap. Because, yeah, it, like you say, it's 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 definitely worth a rewatch. It's It's really well made. So that was Quest for Fire, and as always, if you enjoyed the video, let us know in the comments below. Hit the subscribe button up there, and don't forget to push the bell for notifications. There's other videos to check out over there. Come and find us on social media, and join us again next week for another video.